Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Community Church. And for those of you that have ordered the, the timeline that we use so frequently, um, thank you for ordering it, and I'm going to explain today how you can use it. We use a timeline to help us understand and identify where we are in the program of God. Understanding the Bible is easier if you know who God is speaking to. Because the whole Bible is for you, but not the whole Bible is to you. And understanding what does not belong to you is just as important as understanding what does belong to you. As a matter of fact, knowing what doesn't belong to you is probably more important because when you take something, or should I say when you steal something from another dispensation, written to another group of people, and it wasn't written to you, and you bring that into the body of Christ, then that will produce nothing but confusion and can lead to discouragement and even probably lead to apostasy. If you know that certain things were not written to you, that's not going to happen. But there are people who get discouraged today because they read something out of the law and it puts them under a certain kind of bondage and fear that in the dispensation of grace they're not supposed to have. I mean, the testimony of most people who, who understand the word of God rightly divided or who come to know the word of God rightly divided is that now it's easier for them to understand and the confusion is gone. So when you want to share right division with someone, Usually, the last thing that you want to do is just open the chart without first having created a dilemma for them. And what I mean by that is that people don't know that they need to understand the Word of God rightly divided until there's a problem that they don't understand. And when somebody finally asks a question, why did Peter say this and why did Paul say that, that's a hint that they are reading their Bible and now they have a question, and at that point, they're primed to really get an understanding of why that dilemma is in the Bible. But if they don't have a problem, if they don't see these things that are different, written to, in, in the Gospels are different than what Paul wrote, and what Paul wrote are different than what Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation... If they don't see that, you can't help them. So you're going to create that problem. You're going to create that dilemma. Because let's face it, today, most people don't read their Bibles enough to ask the question, why did Peter say that and why did Paul say that? They just don't do it. I mean, that's how I came to understand right division. Because it was like, man. And, of course, like everybody else in the beginning, I used to try to make excuses for it, go to the Greek, spiritualize it, anything, or even say, oh, there's something I don't understand right now, so I'll just put it on the shelf. God will give me more light in the future. So with some people, you, you could just be able to open the chart with enthusiasm and say, hey, look what I learned about the Bible and that may work, but you have to remember that there's a satanic war against this clear understanding of the Word of God. Satan doesn't want people to see the truth of the Word of God rightly divided. Because it's in the rightly divided Word that his demise is clearly delineated. So if he can get you from seeing that, he's happy. So with most people, you're not just going to open this up and start sharing the Word of God rightly divided because they don't even know they need it. So you're going to have to create a dilemma. And the way you create a dilemma is you create a dilemma by showing them two verses from different dispensations. For example, in Matthew chapter 20, this is like you need to take some notes. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 is a great, great verse to show. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister 
and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for many. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, this would what I would call the sister verse to that. Of course, they're not friendly sisters. They both have different fathers, and I don't think they both like each other. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So in Matthew chapter 20, 28, you have Jesus Christ being a ransom for many. Paul says Jesus Christ is a ransom for all. Well, that is a contradiction. Those two verses are not saying the same thing. So the important question is, why are they saying different things? That's one of the dilemmas you can create. That's one of them. Or you could go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, Paul said, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law or without the works of the law. All right, that's clear. Now, that is a Pauline doctrine. You know, a lot of people hate Paul because of this verse. A lot of people say, what, why, did Paul even, why was Paul even writing in the New Testament? He didn't know what he was talking about. Of course we have to do things. And they hate this verse. And they hate Paul because of it. I don't know how they reconcile that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work, or every good work. But also, in connection with Romans 3.28, uh, 3, is Galatians 2.16. It's another verse that says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And not the works of the law, for by the works of the law, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now these are Pauline doctrines. And Paul, in Acts chapter 13, verse 39, said the same thing. Acts 13, 39 and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So there's a verse, Acts 13, 39, that says the law of Moses cannot justify you. Keeping the law, the works of the law, cannot justify you. So those three verses really emphasize that your salvation cannot be earned, that the works of the law have nothing to do with it. And those are in, Paul spoke those, Acts 13, Paul was speaking that, and then Romans and Galatians are Paul's epistles. But when you compare those verses to James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And of course, the question that you have to ask is, why does Paul say you're, not, you're justified by faith without the works of the law? And why does James say a man is not justified by faith only? He's justified by works. But the one that you probably should use, the one you probably should use to create a dilemma is, and, you know, here's, here's a little, I'm not going to call it a trick because it's not a trick, but a little method that I've learned as sharing rightly dividing with other people is rather than show them something, you have to take on like the wounded bird, the wounded bird mentality, 
where you present it not as showing them, but in asking them. Like Acts 10.35, okay? And you can, you can say something like, you know what? There's verses in the Bible that always threw me for a loop. Okay, now you put yourself like in the, in the position of, I'm not trying to teach you something, but I'm hurt. <laughs> There's verses that always threw me for a loop, like Acts 10, 35 and 36. I mean, Acts 10, 34 and 35. <clears throat> said, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So Peter says that you're accepted with God by works of righteousness. Now that's not the gospel of the grace of God, is it? Now the sister verse to that would be Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. Ephesians 1 and verse 6, Paul said, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Peter says that he that worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Paul says you're accepted in Christ. God accepts you because you're in Christ. So why did Peter say one thing and Paul say another? Those are methods to create the dilemma. Because until somebody realizes that the Bible is not all for them, they'll just go back and forth in Deuteronomy 28, claiming all those promises, claiming the promises in the gospel that they like. They never obey what Jesus Christ said, but they think that Jesus Christ is, is speaking to them. But they don't obey him. Jesus, Jesus Christ said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. That would be me. If, if, you, if you believe that he wrote that to you. Also, Jesus Christ said, go not to the Gentiles. Yet, they all go to the Gentiles. They don't obey that. You know? So, there's a lot of things Jesus Christ said that they don't obey, but they believe he, he wrote those things to, him, to them. But creating the dilemma is the first absolutely the first thing that a person must do in order to understand the Word of God, rightly divided. It's like, you know, I've used this illustration many times, that if somebody's in a pool and they're swimming back and forth and they're not having any problems, if you take one of those big lifesavers and you throw it and you hit him in the side of the head and you put a gash in his forehead and he's bleeding and he's going to look up at you and ask you if you're crazy and probably run you down and put a gash in your head, However, if that same person is in the same swimming pool and he's going down and he's coming up and he's going down, he's breathing, getting for air and he looks like he's about ready to drown and you throw him that lifesaver and he grabs onto it, he's going to be thankful that you did something for him. Well, that's the same thing with the word of God. If people don't see the need to rightly divide, then... They're not going to understand why you're trying to show them right division. They're not going to understand that. We have to create the dilemma unless, like, you know, Joni, when she came into this, she, she had questions. She had a lot of questions that, that the pastors she was hanging out with couldn't answer. She started searching online for answers. She eventually ran across a rightly dividing church in Texas and communicated with them and she learned about right division and then she asked that pastor do you know anybody in Connecticut and he happened to know who I was and he told her about us and Joni showed up here one morning with a big smile and right and it was because she had questions there was a dilemma in her understanding that could not be reconciled through denominational church teaching because they won't answer the questions. They can't. There's only one way you can answer these questions, these dilemmas. You take them, after you've created the dilemma, you take them to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 because once you've showed this dilemma and you say, 
Why are these people saying different things? The inevitable answer is going to be, I don't know. Well, look, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself um, to, uh, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then, see, look, there are some things that, I don't know, it's very easy. Understanding the concept of rightly dividing the word of truth is as simple as this. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's all truth. The whole Bible is truth. It's all truth, but it's not all your truth. Some truth belongs to Israel under the law. Some truth belongs to the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace after Paul was saved. Some truth belongs to Israel going through the tribulation period, the Dan Daniel's 70th week, the time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and tr more truth belongs to Israel out there. This is truth, this is truth, and this is truth. It's all truth. But we must rightly divide their truth from our truth and our truth from their truth. That's what Paul meant by rightly dividing truth. It's all truth. The whole Bible is for you, but it's not all to you. And that's what 2 Timothy 2.15 means, to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, once you've taken them to 2 Timothy 2.15, Without showing this, without showing the timeline, okay, you do that with your Bible. You do that by using your Bible. It's all truth. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all truth. But it's not all your truth. And I like to do the Romans to Philemon. See, Romans to Philemon, that's your truth. So once, once you've done that, rightly dividing means, rightly dividing truth from truth, then you can say, if God inspired Paul to write 2 Timothy 2.15, doesn't it stand to reason that God, through Paul, would show us what he meant by rightly dividing the word of truth? Wouldn't that make sense? And sure, they'll say, of course it would. And that's when you pull out the timeline. That's when you pull it out. Don't open, but you pull it out. And you open to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you read the most important verses in the entire Bible, in the entire Word of God. And those verses are found in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. And you use a King James Bible for obvious reasons. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, in time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then you can open your timeline. And I have two different ones here. I have the regular one that's made out of paper, and I have this one that comes from Roxy, which has been laminated. And it's been laminated so you can write on it with a dry, dry, erase, dry marker. That's what this one's for. So thank you, Roxy. But I'm going to use the dry paper one now. You always, always, always begin with this thing closed. And the reason for that is because... Um, In time past, this did not exist. That did not exist. There was a secret hidden God. And time past is character. There's a certain. There's certain things that characterize 
certain things that characterize time past. And this is like, time past is very important in our Bible. Because time past is where God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, separated him from all the Gentiles in the world, and created the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was separate from the Gentiles that were left down here. When, now there are two verses that really explain this, this separation. One of them is Exodus chapter 11, verse 7. Exodus chapter 11, verse 7. Exodus chapter 11. Verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The Egyptians would be the world, all the Gentiles, everybody else. God himself makes a difference, a distinction between Israel and the rest of the world. Numbers 23, verse 9, Numbers... Chapter 23, notice verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people, that's Israel, shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Israel will not be reckoned among the nations. As long as that distinction exists in your Bible, that Israel is not reckoned among the nations, is separate from the Gentiles, you know that you're in time past. You know you're in time past. The subject of time past, right on the timeline, it says it right there, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. The subject of time past is Daniel 2.44, which says, it's, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. But it says that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom. That's a prophecy of a kingdom to happen way out there in the future. This is the subject of prophecy. As long as this distinction exists in your Bible that the subject is the kingdom, then you know that there's a distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. And every time that there is a distinction between Israel and the Gentiles, you know one thing for sure. The church, the body of Christ, does not exist. The church the, of the body of Christ does not exist. You can be absolutely certain of that. So when the kingdom is in view, there's no... See, that's why we don't pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not looking for a kingdom. Now, I know Pat Robertson is. He thinks we're in the kingdom. You know, there are, there's a whole group in Christianity that think that the kingdom started in A.D. 70. After the destruction, and this is it, we're in the kingdom. And boy, if, if this is as good as the kingdom gets, we're in a lot of trouble. But there are preachers on TV who teach we're in the kingdom right now. You're not in the kingdom. We're not looking for a kingdom. We're looking for a rapture, which... You only learn that from Paul. Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. Paul, Paul's going to teach you that. Okay? So when the kingdom is in view, you know that there's a distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. And when there's a distinction, when there's a wall of partition between Israel and the Gentiles, you know that the body of Christ 
cannot exist. It is impossible. Because the body of Christ is made up of Jews and Gentiles, for there is no difference, Romans 10, 12. There is no difference between us and them. So here we are, Genesis to Malachi ends right here. God breaks the 400 years of silence with the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. John the Baptist comes on the scene and he tells Israel, repent for the kingdom, the kingdom is at hand. This is right on your timeline. It's right there. The kingdom is at hand. Which means the, king, the one who has been promised to come and set up this kingdom is now here. The promised Messiah has come to set up his kingdom. So when he comes, since there's this distinction between Israel and the Gentiles, which still exists, guess what he tells his 12? Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Notice ver verses 5 and 6. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Go not into the way of the Gentiles but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because the promise was made <coughs> to Abraham that they, Israel, would be one day, would be a blessing to all these Gentiles down here. But in order for Israel to be a blessing to all these Gentiles, Israel had to repent. Israel had to be right with God. Israel had to be made, become a kingdom of priests because it was through the priest that the blessing of Israel is going to come to the Gentiles. That's why in the kingdom, they become a kingdom of priests. That's what Peter's talking about. Hebrews to Revelation, Peter's saying that you're a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. Speaking of out of the darkness of the tribulation period into the light of the kingdom. But as priests functioning in the kingdom, they're going to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. That's why all the nations come to Jerusalem to be blessed. It's through the... the, the, the but Jesus Christ came to get the nation to repent and to become a kingdom of priests. That's why John the Baptist was baptizing, to make them a kingdom of priests. Because, you know, the story, that's why um, the priest went through water as the first part of his ritual to become a priest. Water was the first thing. So Israel is getting baptized to become a kingdom of priests to, so that they can be a blessing to the whole world. So in time past, which takes us all the way from Acts chapter 9 or Acts chapter 7 where they stoned Stephen, all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 where God... God separated Abraham from all the nations. Time passed. In Ephesians chapter 2, time passed. The verse we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. This that covers this entire period of time in your Bible. And Paul says, you weren't part of this. You're not part of that. That's time past. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, notice, but now. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Ye, right here, you were far off, right here. The Gentiles, way, way, way far off separated from Israel, way down here. Bunch of idolaters, dogs, you name it. That's what they were. Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, Jews and Gentiles, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, so having made peace. That's what he did. The but now period begins with after the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, God, in act, and God cuts off the prophetic program, saves Saul of Tarsus, gives him the revelation of the mystery, Romans to Philemon, and Paul says, but now. And the but now begins with him, 1 Timothy 1.16, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them who would hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was the first one, and he begins the but now period. And in the but now period, you're introduced to a body of doctrine that is specifically and uniquely crafted by God just for you who are in the dispensation of grace today. It's unique. It's a salvation by grace, through faith, apart from the works of the law. You know, there are men that preach salvation. One of the great preachers from, uh, where's Martin Lloyd-Jones from? Um, Muirfield. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a great English preacher. And he has a great commentary on the book of Romans. And one of his books is on Romans chapter 3. And he does a great job explaining this salvation by grace. But he doesn't have a clue about rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, he gets all caught up in this stuff, and he butchers it. He did a thing on the Sermon on the Mount, and he butchered it because he made it apply over here. He took it from here, and he dropped it in here, and that's like trying to put a car in reverse, and you're grinding. The, the, you're grinding. It's not going in. That's what they do when they take the law and bring it into the dispensation of grace. The but now period is characterized by Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. Romans chapter 16. Notice verse 25, a great, great, great passage of Scripture. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you, look at this, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Here is a passage of scripture that says that God is able to establish you. In Romans chapter 1, he establishes you. By the time you get to the end of Roman, he establishes you, not establishes you. In Romans, you're established. The foundation is built. By the time you get to the end of Romans, you're stabilized. You, you're not moved to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Okay? Paul says that God is able to establish you and give you an internal fortitude and an internal stability but there's only one way it can be done. By my gospel, according to my gospel. Paul's gospel is Romans to Philemon. That's his gospel. Three times he says he calls it my gospel. Romans chapter 2.16, right here, 16.25 and 1 Timothy. But notice he says that now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and, and, okay, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Paul says that's able to st stabilize you, not the preaching of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry to Israel. That doesn't stabilize you. That makes you weaker and weaker because that's not, he's not, he's not your shepherd like he was Israel's shepherd. He's the resurrected head of the body of Christ and your relationship with him 
is not an earthly one. It's a heavenly one. It's on a spiritual plane. Paul's gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, is what gives you your stability. This gospel, in Romans 16, 25, Paul said, which was kept secret. This was kept secret since the world began. Man, since way back there, this gospel was kept a secret, but it was hidden God because it was prepared before the foundation of the world. This gospel was prepared before the foundation of the world, and it was kept secret since the world began. Now that is totally different than Luke chapter 1. Notice Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Notice Luke chapter 1. And here's in verse 67. This is a prophecy of John the Baptist, or speaking of John the Baptist. And his father, Zacharias, John, uh, Luke 167, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of all his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Here's a body of doctrine for Israel that was spoken since the world began. It wasn't a secret. It was spoken since the world began. Paul says, what I'm preaching was kept secret since the world began. And, and in Ephesians chapter 3, he said about his doctrine, he said about this, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. That's why we rightly divide truth from truth. Because this truth was kept secret back here while this was preached since the world began. Makes it clear, easy, right? So Paul, we call him the but now apostle. Because he said, I speak to you Gentiles. One of the most fascinating things about Paul is that when he, God saved him on the road to Damascus, God commissioned him. Gave him a commission that had never been done or fulfilled before. And that commission was, go to the Gentiles. Because from all the way back here, when God separated Abraham from all the Gentiles, they were separated. They stayed separated from the Gentiles. Go not to the Gentiles. Here in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, they went everywhere preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. They were fulfilling the Great Commission, which said go into all the world, but all the world to them meant the world of the Jews. And that's what they did, Acts eleven nineteen, 19. And they went everywhere preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Because they knew that Israel had to be saved in order for this kingdom to come into existence. Right? So here Paul is introduced. This is the but now period. There it is, Ephesians 2, 13. That's to us. This is for us. This is for us. This is for us. But only this is to us. So in Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2, we have time past, but now, and what else? Ages to come. What verse is that? That's right, Ephesians 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now, so the Bible, so we started by saying, 2 Timothy 2.15 said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and that rightly dividing meant rightly dividing their truth from our truth and our truth from their truth, and we said, 
if God, through Paul, told you to rightly divide, then would not God, through Paul, show you how to rightly divide? And, of course, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about time past, but now, and ages to come. After the rapture of the church, God is going to resume his prophetic dealings with Israel right where he left off in Acts chapter 7, and the writers to the Hebrews to Revelation write about that period of time when Israel is going to go through Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation period. He taught the, and that's what the writer to the Hebrews, and that's why when you get over here, you're no longer talking about salvation by grace through faith anymore. You're now talking about faith and works. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. A doctrine that is totally foreign to the body of Christ. Revelation chapter 12. Notice verse 17. And the dragon, that's Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Notice, this is in the tribulation period, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ is also faith in Christ, but it's also works. Faith and works are back after the rapture of the church just as they were before the dispensation of grace began, before God saved Saul of Tarsus. Notice also Revelation chapter 14. Notice Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's faith and works. Faith and works have been reintroduced in the tribulation period. And that's why Hebrews says things totally different than what Paul says. I love the comparison between Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is a promise that you are saved and that you're going to make it into eternity. You can be confident of that. However, Hebrews 10, verse 26, if we sin willfully, if ye sin willfully after that you've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Hebrews chapter 6, turn to Hebrews 6, I want to read you this verse, because when I was in Warren, Michigan last week preaching, a lady came up to me, a French lady came up to me and said she was so troubled when she read these verses after she was saved that she could not sleep for a whole week because she thought she was going to hell. And she had trusted Christ as her Savior and was saved. And her pastor could not explain to her why this verse was in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And she said, I knew I was enlightened. I knew my eyes had been opening. I was understanding the Bible. She said, and then it said, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. I knew I had tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. I knew I was partaker of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God. I love the word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Now notice the, the verse begins, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, who tasted, who did this, who that. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. And she said, you know what? I wasn't perfect. I was saved, but I wasn't perfect. But this verse made me lose all hope of my salvation. That poor lady. She was like that tall. And she, I mean, we fell in love, okay? 
she was like 65, 67. And she just, she just come, she would come to me after I was up here, she said, I'm going to miss you so much. <laughs> this lady thought that this applied to her, and she lost all hope. But look at the verses. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. That's at Pentecost. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. That's at Pentecost. All those people who were there. They were there. And have tasted the, of the good word of God. Notice, and the powers of the world to come. When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, on all those people that were there, there were people from every language, tongue, nation in the whole world. And the Holy Spirit fell and put upon them the power of the world to come, that kingdom program. That's why the Holy Spirit came, to, to prepare them, to indwell them, to empower them, to go to the nations of the world and be a blessing to them. But they had to repent first. They had, were given that one-year extension of mercy to repent. But those people felt the powers of the world to come. And it says to them, if, if, they sin. Or how does it say it? If they shall fall away. What happened? They fell. They fell in Acts chapter 7. They fell. If they shall fall away, it's impossible to renew them unto repentance again. And it was impossible because God saved Saul of Tarsus and introduced the dispensation of grace. And those people that fell, they fell. Saul was forgiven. And there are some who came from the, from the little flock who came when they heard Paul's gospel would have been no different back then hearing Paul's gospel whether you were a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, a Catholic, a Muslim, any religion in the world, if they heard Paul's gospel could respond to it and embrace it and trust Jesus Christ according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. They could have been saved. But there's a whole group here who fell. And it was impossible to renew them again. The ones that stoned Stephen, that verse says, and that's what this is talking about. Notice that, that phrase, the world to come. Well, go back one, one or two pages to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and notice that... This is talking about the early chapters of the book of Acts here, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. But notice verse 5, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. The writer to the Hebrews acknowledges that he's writing about the world to come. The writer to the Hebrews is writing that he's saying what we're writing about is about the world to come. That's the world to come the kingdom. That's the world to come for the nation of Israel. Okay? Our place is in the heavens, in the ages to come. That's the world to come. You know, there's two things that are coming. One is the ages to come for the body of Christ. One is the world to come for Israel in the dispensation of, uh, in the, dispensation of the fullness of times. So, that's how the timeline is very simply and easily to be understood. That's how it is. Time passed, but now, ages to come. Now God, who inhabits eternity and doesn't have a past and doesn't have a future, he lives in an eternal present, did that for our benefit, not for his. He did that so that you would know, so that you would understand when things changed in your Bible. He did that so you could recognize it. Time passed. He did that so you would know that in time past, you were not part of this. He introduced the but now and identified it in a very, very clear documented format called Romans to Philemon. So you would know that who you are in Christ is totally different than what these people were in Christ 
according to, they believed in him as the Messiah. So there's a sense in which they were in Christ. Because Romans 15 talks about those that were in Christ before Paul. Well, that's them. But they were in Christ according to prophecy under the law. Not in Christ by imputed righteousness like you are. That's completely different now. So God wrote this time past, but now, and ages to come, so you would know in your Bible where things stop, where things started, where things stop again at the rapture, and where things start again. And you know what? If you follow Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to John and the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, and then you see where Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9, and in Philemon, Philemon is the picture of Onesimus who goes back to his master, and it's a picture of the church going back to their master. It's a picture of the rapture, and after the rapture is Hebrews to Revelation, and there's your Bible, a perfect timeline of your Bible clearly laid out so that you can't get confused, and the only way you can get confused is if you disobey 2 Timothy 2.15. The only verse in your Bible that tells you how to study your Bible. The only one. And yet everybody in Christianity wants to disobey the one verse that would open their understanding. That they would obey. Consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding. And if they obeyed that, there would be no denominations. There would be no different churches on every corner. We would all be walking by the same rule and minding the same thing and being of the same mind. And there'd be one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There wouldn't be two baptisms like they're taught today in the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ. That wouldn't exist. But those all exist because people want to disobey that one simple little word, verse. And this, especially this simple little phrase, rightly dividing Truth from truth and truth from truth. Amen? How simple it is. How simple it is to rightly divide. Some people walk away from this. I just can't understand it. It has blown me away, and after preaching these last five messages, has blown me away even more. Amen? Amen? But you that have just received this timeline and have just watched this message about this timeline, remain faithful to the word. Hold fast the faithful word as you have been taught. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Teach no other doctrine. That's your responsibility from now on. If you heard this and you didn't know about rightly dividing, well, now you know. There's no more excuses. Nobody can stand in front of God and say, well, I didn't know. No, you know. Your excuses have just been ripped out from under you. But what a blessing it is to rightly divide the word of God. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful that we can sit around a book, around an understanding and see that the bird's eye view of the word of God from the beginning all the way to the end and see the clear divisions that God himself made in his own word to remove the confusion that would enshroud Christianity today. I pray that the words of this message on this timeline will find lodging in the hearts of those that listen to it and will be forged upon the tablets of their hearts. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.